Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift you high. We magnify you. We give you glory. Thank you, Jesus. A gathering together is unto you, not unto any man. Therefore, we welcome your sweet presence, Holy Spirit. We welcome, welcome your presence, Almighty God. We welcome your presence, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you will teach, you will instruct, you will encourage, you will correct, and you will comfort. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said, we need not that any man teach us, because the anointing that is within teaches us all things. We give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Bible Study. This is, I believe, Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. A bunch of believers who love the Lord crazily. Amen. We study scriptures verse by verse because we believe no one buys the Bible, jumps about chapters, the paragraphs, and the sentences in it. But you start from, you read from beginning to the end. That way you understand the contents of the book and hopefully the mind of the author or the purpose for which the author wrote. And since we've been doing that, we have seen growth. We have seen, we've seen God do tremendous things. Um, the growth is reflected in our prayer lives. We're seeing God answer and do miraculous things. Got a testimony yesterday. I, I'm not sure if we should share it. <laughs> She's bubbling over. <laughs> All right, we'll wait on you. Glory to God. He's, he's just doing awesome things in the lives of his people. And I am I am just so proud of every single one of you. And I, I rejoice with you because now you know that these things are real. Madam Chichi, where are we going? Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, we have one more day to look at the book on marriage. And so um, it's what's left of it is not very long because yesterday I was conscious of time and I skipped the whole thing. It's a hundred and uh, it's a hundred and sixty-four page book. But there was a lot that we left out. I want to encourage you to buy it. Right, the the knowledge in it, <clears throat> the reference that it can give. You heard Mfon and Uduak testify yesterday. Uh, about what the book is doing for them. I am so grateful to God because I I, I learned a lot, a lot in the 36 years that I was married. I was forced to go to God concerning my marriage because it was a very difficult one. Praise God. And you know, out of, out of pain sometimes, great things can be birthed. So I know that the book will be a blessing. The Bible says older women should school younger women in the book of Titus. But we don't see that happening. You know, two people meet each other, do whatever that they want to do, however they want, want to do it, whenever they want to do it. And when they decide they want to marry, they come to the church. Well, the last one year, the last two years that they've been together, we were not a part of that. They expect us to give them marriage counseling. And they schedule marriage counseling, max maybe three weeks. You know, and they expect you to run this race with three weeks of what? Every day is different and every marriage is different. The principles of God are the same. That's why you must build on the principles of the word of God. That's the only thing that's constant. You will change over time. Your spouse will change over time. When both of you are together, it's one way. When a kid is introduced into it, it's a completely different ball game. By the time you have two, three, four, it's <laughs> it's something else altogether. All the stuff that you have to juggle, in-laws, your own family, the job, the boss, the this, the that, the stress is a lot. And it would do you well to be well-schooled so that you can handle whatever the challenges present. All right, so this morning we're just going to, um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and uh, look at some of the things in sex, uh, when we talked about sex that I did not really mention. 
Uh, and then we'll look at the last part of the book. Praise God. I'm trying to determine where to take you from. And I, I think I'll take it from page 112. Yeah. <clears throat> this part is the part about sex that's in this book. Before I decided to do a completely uh, independent book on, on the subject itself. So I'll pick it up here. Some of it may have talked about, but um, wisdom translated. Uh, the word that's the Hebrew word that's translated wisdom actually means pound it in. Pound wisdom in until it becomes a part of it. All right, so I'm starting from where it says God is interested in, in, in sex. It is evident that God is very much interested in his children. If he keeps a record of the hair on our heads and knows when one falls, then he must be interested in even the minutest details of our lives. God is interested in sex. Not only that, he has also given us divine guidelines as to how we are to participate in and enjoy this precious gift of marital intimacy. As I said earlier, sex was designed by God to be performed under the covering of marriage within a marriage relationship. Sex is based on a covenant, the covenant of marriage and should be characterized by commitment and dedication to one single partner with whom one is in that covenant relationship. The seed of man is very precious in the sight of God. It is responsible for and empowered to ignite the process of life. It is not designed to be shed abroad, or as, or as is commonly said, sowing one's royal oats. Let's examine the Bible account of the life of a young man called Unan. And I've talked about that. Unan was the one who, uh, according to tradition, was called to give seed to his elder brother's wife. He spilled it on the ground and God killed him. To tell you that God is interested in sex and God, it matters to God what you do with your seed, young man. It matters to God. If it didn't, he wouldn't strike Unan dead. We're under grace. That's why we're doing all, all of the nonsense that we're doing in the New Testament. If it was before where the law, it was instant justice. None of us will dare do some of the things that we do. All right. So I'm not going to go into that anymore. Um, I already talked about it when we talked about sex in the other book. Of course, this anger God is through Onan. And so it lets us know that the seed of a man, indeed all men, seeing that we're ultimately accountable to God, whether saved or unsaved, is not to be sown carelessly or irresponsibly. Through the seed, God has entrusted an awesome responsibility to the man and the woman in marriage, that of procreating, and not only that, being custodians of eternal spirit beings, to the extent that we are responsible for the children that we bring into this world. Man is tripartite in nature. We are spirit beings. We possess a soul. We live inside a body. From the moment of conception, the spirit that has been alive with the Father unites with the body that is being formed. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 makes us understand that. Even before we were formed in our mother's womb, we were in existence with God. God knew us. He was just waiting for mom and pop to get together and create the body. That eternal spirit, you, would need to be able to operate on planet Earth. This is the reason why abortion is abominable. It's an abomination before the Lord. Besides being a totally brutal and barbaric act towards a completely defenseless human being, killing the body, which is the fetus, it discounts the soul and the spirit, which is very much a part of the unborn child. Abortion does not take into consideration the soul, which is the seat of our affections, the mind, the will, emotions, and intellect. It does not stop to reckon with the soulish area and the excruciating pain in the body of the unborn, nor does it take into account the spirit of that child. Naked but not ashamed. I want to say 
sometime in 1996. I read it once before, not in the fellowship then. Um, I'm going to read it to you that have not heard it before. I wrote it in the third person, speaking for the unborn child. Here I am, engulfed in my world. The only things I have known are peace, tranquility, and bliss. Here I am, minding my own business, living and growing as I am supposed to do. Suddenly, I am stirred. Rudely, I am awakened, and the chase begins. But really, there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. The search is on. I try to escape, cringing, sliding, dodging, moving to the furthest end of these walls that confine me. I slither and slide. Nowhere to run. Nowhere to hide. I thought this was an haven. I thought this was a safe place. I thought it was your place to protect, nourish, and nurture me. The steel jaws of the forceps take hold of my foot, tugging, pulling, dragging me outward. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Ouch! What was that? The waters are cloudy. They turn to red. Is that my blood flowing freely from my veins? My heart is racing. I'm all confused. Ouch! What was that? I'm screaming, but I can't be heard. I'm crying, but you cannot see my tears for the blood. When you cut up my flesh, or you crush my bones, when you puncture my skull to extract my brain, have you stopped to think? What pain? What pain? What excruciating pain? When the wiring sound of the suction tubes Suck the very life out of me when you silence my voice before it is heard. When you decide that I ought not to live. Have you ever stopped to think what pain, what pain, what excruciating pain? I am spirit with a soul, mind, emotions, will, intellect, living in a body just like yours. What happens to my spirit and my soul? When my body you destroy. This is not the choice. This is the consequence. When you said yes. To lie with that man. You made the choice. If I could be asked. If I. Could make a choice. What do you suppose my answer would be? Let me live. Please, let me live. Mm -hmm. Naked but not ashamed. It is my earnest prayer that this book in your hands will emancipate you totally to really and truly find the full expression of your love for each other through the beautiful gift of sexual love. In view of this, I want to examine the issue of nakedness and shame, because I believe it is one of the inhibitions we suffer from the excess baggage of the past. Women are generally sensitive and open, especially to the things of the spirit. I would like to see the same openness on the subject of sexual love. Preconceived misconceptions have caused many women to be hindered in the total surrender that is necessary for the act of sex to be as gratifying as it is for men. Many women still find it difficult to undress in the presence of their husbands, and that's how you will know that this was written in the year 2000. Because all that, all that reservedness and shyness and whatnot is out the window. Women dress any which way, they don't care to keep any parts private. So some of my book, contents of this book, dates it. Many women still find it difficult to undress in the presence of their husbands, especially newlyweds. Our mothers have not helped much either because of all of the old wives' tales. Likewise, Satan is obliged 
has obliged by obliged us by feeding us lies that sex is dirty and to actually want sex is cheap. Well, to some extent, and for the, and for the first time in Satan's life, I think he's right. Sex outside of marriage is all of that, dirty and cheap. However, in the marriage setting, sex is beautiful and pure. It is a God-given gift. It was the first blessing God pronounced on man. Sex was God's idea. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God has given us all things to freely enjoy. All. Sex is a part of all. Wait a moment. Have we not been taught? Let me skip that. You read it. I don't want to put that on tape. Praise God. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there should be complete liberty in bed with your spouse. Right? You buy the book, you can read everything I'm skipping. Married women. The Bible talks about rendering due benevolence. I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right. So that's what I want to talk about here. Women who give excuses. I just made my hair. Like I said before, I wish I was your husband. I wish I was a guy. I'll be all up in that hair. Because it's my money you spent to fix it. Praise God forevermore. I'm tired. You were tired last night. You were tired two nights ago. You were tired three nights ago. What's wrong with you? Not wanting to render due benevolence, as the Bible puts it, a cat and mouse game ensues between husband and wife. Some people don't want to do it as have sex with lights on. <laughs> that is taboo. Whereas these same women will not think twice about undressing in a doctor's office in front of a doctor or a, nurse or a nurse who is a perfect stranger. Never mind the thousands of wattage of illumination in the doctor's office. But to undress with your spouse, who is the rightful owner of your body, becomes a problem. The Bible says the man and his wife were naked before each other and they were not ashamed. Shame was introduced in the Garden of Eden after sin entered. And ruined what God had done. If you feel any kind of a anxiety or shame about being naked in front of your husband, do a self-check. There may be sin or guilt lurking in your subconscious. I don't know what kids do now, but I doubt that they have the reservation that my generation had when we got married. All right. There is a difference between shame and shyness. Shame is a product of guilt while shyness is a product of innocence and purity. Repeated exposure to one another will eventually cause shyness to give way to a deep desire to satisfy each other's needs, which in turn will bring about a relaxed and comfortable state with one another. Adam and Eve were perfectly comfortable around God as he would come in the cool of the day to fellowship with them. It was recorded that they were naked and they were not ashamed. However, after they sinned, a foreign emotion called shame was introduced, and they attempted to cover that shame by making fig leaves for themselves to cover their nakedness. You have been called to render due benevolence, so enjoy all that the Lord has freely given you. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 to 5. Your cat and mouse game is nothing short of rebellion. Women who are always making excuses. It's generally like that. Sometimes men too make excuses. They're tired. Or they, they're not. I, I'm yet to find a man who's, who has said to me, I'm not in the mood. I don't think men are never in the mood. Praise God. It's us women who, who say that nonsense. Your cat and mouse game is nothing short of rebellion. And the scripture says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So if you withhold sex, you are a witch. Period. End of story. Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. To not give that comfort to your spouse is rebellion. And if rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, then you are practicing witchcraft when you withhold sex. 
That's why people like Steve Harvey can write that a man can only wait for, for 90 days. All right. Let me let me let me help you because this was what I did in my when when I was married. All right, because I understand how we feel, women. Sex for us is is largely not physiological. It is emotional. For the man, it is physiological. He needs it. All right? And so for you to say no, day after day after day, one week, two weeks, you're being wicked. And you expect him to not go out. It's not like a meal where he can go to a restaurant and buy himself whatever he wants to eat. If your body is the only body he's supposed to be with, how do you explain withholding sex from him for a week? And this was how I got over that, that hurdle. Okay? Uh, biologically, I am told, I'm not a scientist, but I know I've read it, that it takes about two to three days for the semen in a man to repl uh, replenish itself. That's not to say they cannot make love two, three times a day, every day, especially when they're young. But it takes a minute for it to replenish itself. I said to myself, if I, if I allow sex twice a week, that's like every three days, all right? That's just eight times in a month. Eight times out of 30 days. What is my justification for withholding sex? Eight times 12 is 96. 96 times in a year. What is my justification? 96 days is how many months? Talk to me. Three months. Three months in a year if you make love twice a week. Is that too much for your spouse to ask of you? Three months out of a year. Well, maybe what I'm thinking or saying is not applicable anymore because all these young people, they do all kinds of things now you can't even imagine. Well, wives, please stop driving their hearts to sin. Told you the way to deal with a man who is demanding, who wants sex every day. Question who? Wear him out. Psych yourself. Put yourself in that frame of mind every day. He will beg you. He will tell you he's tired and then you will tell him, no, you're not tired. I'll do all the work. You lay back. Right? Stop that nonsense. If you're married and you're starving your husband or your wife of sex, a witch. All right. Do not withhold sexual love. Do not use it as a reward or punishment. To do so is tantamount to witchcraft. When you seek to manipulate your spouse with sex, by refusing to yield your body to one another to enjoy, you violate the word of God. That's why sex is spiritual. And you deprive each other of this gift from God. The Bible calls withholding of sexual love fraud. It says defraud ye not one another. That's a very strong word. 1 Corinthians 7. To withhold sexual love is fraudulent. You are in rebellion and you are in sin if you starve your spouse with sex. It is written, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Please look for that scripture and put it up. So you begin to die in the area of sexual love and you cannot enjoy it as you were designed to do. Death simply means the absence of life. Sex becomes a chore. It becomes a bother. You perfect the art of lying, feigning, dodging, excuses, sometimes lying. Which roll off your lips with ease. 
show me your sex life and I will show you how spiritual you are. There's nothing more spiritual in your marriage than the very act of sex. The only time God permits abstinence is when you go on a fast by mutual consent in order to abase the flesh, make the spirit more sensitive, and therefore pray more effectively. God is a covenant-keeping God. If you are his child, then you ought to be a covenant-keeping child of a covenant-keeping God. So get with it and live. We've talked about the fact that your spirit, soul, and body, and since you participate in sex with your body, glory to God, my phone is distracting me. I need to put it where? Link bars. All right. Since you participate in it with your body, you have to take care of your body. Right? Sense of smell and taste. You need to smell nice. Thank you. Thankfully, the perfumeries all over the world that have captured different fragrances on a spectrum of the headiest fragrances to the most subtle and anywhere in between, you can find something that pleases yourself and your spouse. Come to Proverbs chapter 7. Maybe I should follow this with Solomon. Where's me? Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. Proverbs 7. Hallelujah. God is an awesome God. Look at verse. Let's read from the top. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. Which means if you don't keep it, you will not live. Like I told you, not living is not necessarily the cessation of life. It's just dying in that particular area of your life, not living it to the fullest. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine hearts. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. Call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house, that's the meter where I'm going, at the window of my house, I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths, young people, listen. A young man, void of understanding. A young man, void of understanding. Passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She's loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, that's outside, now in the streets and lies in wait at every corner. So she caught this young man and kissed him and with an impudent face said to him, I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. She appears to know God. She appears to go to church. She's paid her offerings. She's fulfilled her vows. She looks like it, sounds like it, talks like it. But she's not the real deal. Verse 16. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry. With carved works with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man, my husband, is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to slaughter, as a fool, section of the stars. 
till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken now unto me, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. A house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. That's what the word has to say about adultery. Talking about perfuming your bed. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen. I just read it to you. The Lord Jesus has told us in a parable of the unjust steward to be wise as a serpent and gentle as doves. He said, Luke 16, 8, B part. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. The woman in Proverbs 7 perfumes her bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon and makes her bed as inviting as she possibly can. Can we as women of God do any less? Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2, talks about his kisses. Let, his, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his love is better than wine. Onions, garlic, all of those things, does it turn your spouse off? Why do you eat or cook with it? I'm speaking to the women now, but it's applicable to everybody. I know grandma has sung the unparalleled benefits of raw onions and garlic, and how it gives you good eyesight and longevity of life. What would you need good eyesight and longevity? longevity of life for when your spouse is gone. What about simple hygiene, bad breath? Do you see your dentist regularly to take care of those cavities? Can your spouse sit, safely approach you with the kisses of his mouth? Said in Song of Solomon 1-2, without him killing over. Let it be the freshness of your breath that knocks him over and not the odor of uncomely breath. There are lipsticks that are flavor, mint to wild cherry to strawberry. Name it and it is available. Talking about your sense of smell and your sense of taste. Make yourself attractive. It goes both ways, not just for the women alone. Sense of touch. Is your wife, is your spouse at liberty to explore? Or are there military zones? <laughs> Areas that are out of bounds. Is God. Wives, can he freely touch? When you have a wig, or worse still, curlers on, and your excuse is that you just fixed your hair. Praise God. <laughs> Not tonight, honey. Rolls off of your lips. Stop it. Sense of sight. I mentioned a little bit earlier. For the man, sight is a significant part of the sexual union. What can you see in a room dark as pitch? What about your night clothes that you have fastened on with every zipper, every pin, every button is imaginable? Take it all off, let him see, let him touch. You should go to bed with a negligee where you pull one string and everything drops. Praise God forevermore. Amen, I'm still holy and still anointed. Glory. For man's sight is significant. Experimenting with premarital sex has the danger of building in the subconscious a hiding or a sneaking around mentality that is not on, that is only comfortable in the dark. Again, my book is 2000. It was written in 2000. I'm sure it's not like that with all these young people anymore. They are so brazen. Repent and receive forgiveness if that has been a part of your past and enter into the joy of the liberty of the sons of God. We have been called unto liberty, Galatians 5.13. We cannot use that liberty to gratify the desires of the flesh. We must serve one another in love. While sight may be so important to the man and light is required to see, he must in turn be sensitive and considerate of his wife's delicate feelings. The fact that he needs light does not warrant stadium capacity lights. Oh my God. Lighting can enhance the experience and other thoughtful measures like good adequate locks on the door to protect and ensure privacy, a strong sturdy bed does not creak, clothing, energy, sheets, music can be implemented to add to the comfort level 
of the experience, sense of hearing. The importance of hearing cannot be overemphasized. We are raised in an environment that lays so much emphasis on feedback. We demand and offer feedback as essential communication from your dealings at work with the boss and colleagues to dealing with school staff, the gas pump attendant, the grocery, grocery clerk, and all that. Word of God lays emphasis on hearing as well, because what you hear affects your thoughts. Your thoughts affect your attitude. Your attitude ultimately affects your actions. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Talk to her, talk to him. Let your spouse know what you're feeling, how they are doing, what they can do better, what they, what they want. Sometimes women tend to be silent. We expect our husbands to know what we want and when he does not do what we want, we get upset. That's typical of women. Do not feel like that takes away from the experience. If your spouse has led a godly decent life, how in the world do you expect him to know what to do? Learn and grow together. We have been programmed. All of these are not relevant anymore, but it's in the book for those that it is still relevant, relevant for. But I, I know a few people who are still keeping themselves. We have been programmed not to ask for sex. Our subconscious minds have believed a lie that asking cheapens us, talking to women. Break loose of all those lies. Begin what I call Operation Who, wear him out. Words have creative power. I can paint a picture with words and you will capture it with a vivid imagination. Uh, know that the power of the spirit of God is present to create and those tender words of endearment that you speak to one another, he can use. This is one reason why sexual love has healing power. You cannot stay mad at a spouse that you've just been intimate with. It is one sure way to not let the sun go down upon your anger. I am not saying that sex is to be used to sweep issues under the carpet. Unfortunately, men have a tendency to want to do this. All I'm saying is that it aids in the healing process, makes it faster. It forges a closeness that allows the unsavory situation to die out. Continue to have sex even when issues are not raised even when issues are unresolved. I know this sounds impossible for most women because our emotions play a significant part in our sex drive, but the answer to that is simple. What is the answer? Compartmentalize. Ladies, let me let you into a secret. I have found out that while we lump issues in, on our minds together, men tend to compartmentalize issues. In their minds, one issue has nothing to do with the other. This is why there might be an unresolved matter between you both, and perhaps you have even indulged in a quarrel, but your husband will be ready at the drop of a hat to make love to you. Men have a way of keeping issues separate in their minds. For us, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Sex later at night. Sex later at night starts at the breakfast table. We expect attention from our husbands, not only at bedtime, but from the morning before leaving for work. Learn this, Compartment compartmentalization will help you locate and confine issues so that they do not spill over into other areas. We must learn to submit ourselves one to another as the scriptures prescribe in Ephesians 5, 21. If you will not submit your body, you will not submit your soul. When you stop having sex, you allow the spirit of Jezebel to enter and the manipulation and the control is set into the relationship. Next, stay attractive to one another. There's a general tendency to let yourself go after marriage or the birth of children. Really and truly in this present age we live in, we have no excuse for that. Get in the gym, do some kind of, get into some kind of exercise program. Practice good eating habits. Take adequate rest. Keep your body healthy and fit. Scripture says bodily exercise profited little. It does not say it does not profit, only that it profits little. Remember your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You must keep it holy. Sins of indulgence, indulgence like gluttony must be held in check. One of the rare occasions that we see the Lord Jesus Christ was furious when he reacted to how the temple of God was being used. He made a whip and he whipped all of them out of the temple. If he would do that with a physical building, how do you think he feels with your body that you abuse every day by eating what you ought not to eat, drinking what you ought not to drink, 
and generally not taking care of your body, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to skip because I mentioned all the salient stuff. <laughs> Amen. You'll find it in the book when you buy it. The last chapter in the book. Praise God for everyone. Thank you, Lord. Um, why is this book called Marriage is Sound Check? It's because the wisdom upon which the book is written rests on the four areas we've looked at. MICS, money, in-laws, communication, and sex. Mics. That's why it's called a sound check. All right. Marriage is a vital part of God's plan for humanity. And he could find no better way to describe or convey its importance to us other than to compare it with the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. God designed marriage to give him glory, reflect his love and order, and bring him pleasure. Marriage is the basic unit of society. From marriages come families, and families make up the church. This is the one reason why the vengeance of the devil has been unleashed against families. By destabilizing families, it is, it is the intent of his depraved mind to somehow disorganize the church, but is fighting a losing battle. Because Jesus Christ said unequivocally in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon the short foundation of the revelation of the person of Jesus as the son of the living God, he's building the church. And neither hell nor its authorities can ever have dominion over the church. That is extremely comforting to know that as long as Jesus Christ is the great architect of the church and families are the weft and the wolf of the very tapestry of his divine fingers, families are here to stay. Divorce rates in the church are at an appalling and alarming rate. They equal, if not surpass, the statistics of the world. You and your spouse must determine not to become one of those numbers. Dangers and disadvantage of, disadvantages of broken homes far outweigh the selfish motivations that lead to divorce and separation. Some of the dis disadvantages of broken homes and marriages. Number one, deep emotional and psychological scars on all concerned. Everyone whether you're the one that walked away or not. Everyone, the husband, the wife, children, extended family, relations, and friends are all affected when a marriage breaks down, especially when marriage has weathered a significant number of years. The attendant problems include, but are not limited to, one, insecurity. Insecurity, especially for the wife that is left and for the children of the marriage. Two, rejection. Feelings of rejection, low self-esteem, depression, and other negative emotional conditions. Anger and hatred. Anger and hatred directed towards the deserting spouse. Anger from the children towards either or both of the spouses, depending on whom they perceive to be responsible for the pickup. Fear of the unknown. Fear of having to face the future alone. Fear of raising the children alone. Fear of being ostracized by the community, loss of friends and acquaintances, relocation, the upheaval of having to move from one city to another or from one neighborhood to another, a complete change of lifestyle. Five, that's five, relocation. Six, financial crisis, loss of income and the inability to handle bill and expenses alone. I suffered all these things. I know what I am talking about. Breaking up the home is not worth it. It's not. Number two. I was number one that had part six parts. Number two. Confusion and hurt. Feelings of failure. Feelings of confusion, feelings of hurt, a roller coaster of emotions that is difficult to sort through. 
unanswered questions and myriads of problems emanating from the tearing apart of two souls, fitly knit, and two spirits that God joined as one. Three, the shipwrecking of the spiritual walk and faith of the family. The children are particularly more vulnerable in this area. Having been taught Christian values, there is difficulty in marrying what they have been taught and what they are now involuntarily thrust into. If care is not taken, many of the children may invariably end up in the world or in the wrong kind of relationship. Jesus Christ said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You can have this abundant life in your marriage. The thief here is Satan, the devil. His major target is the family. It is the most effective way to affect an entire generation of children, and ultimately the society. In the 60s, with the advent of the hippie culture, a godless generation was birthed with loose values and a rebellion from any moral values held in esteem by the older generation. A slow desensitization of the minds of this generation began to infiltrate every facet of society. Notable of this was the media and what Satan succeeded in accomplishing. A quick example is television programming. Witchcraft was repackaged and presented to the masses as harmless sitcoms with programs like I Dream of Genie, Bewitched, Adam's Family. Think about it. Why would a creepy show such as that be called Adam's Family? And they spell the Adams with two Ds. When the first man God created, God called Adam. Is there something else we should be taking a closer look at? I think so. People read Harry Potter. People, people, people consult Ouija boards. People consult tarot card readers. People consult, consult crystal ball gazers. Christians, and they don't think it's wrong. They don't know it's wrong. These kinds of programs paved way for more evil programs and movies that Hollywood now turns out. Each program and subsequent ones striving to outdo the former in terms of how evil they can be. I wrote this in 2000. You can imagine where we are now. The capture of this generation of the 60s led to the birth of what the media calls baby boomers, and that's my generation. A permissive, hedonistic generation who are now the parents of the nameless, faceless, godless generation called Gen X. Now they are millennials and Generation Z. The depravity has worsened the generations. The introduction of pot, marijuana, weed, psychedelic drugs in the 60s, and subsequent infiltration of harder drugs like heroin, co cocaine, etc., exacerbated an, an already worsening situation in the American society. Abundant life is available for you and your family, just as Satan cleverly captured the generation back in the 60s, the resultant effects of which the church is, not, is now having to contend with in the field of evangelism. Even so, we as believers and heads of families, men, must strive to keep our homes in order, raise God-fearing children, or turn the tide of things and influence their peers for the kingdom of God. I draw from Matthew 7, 24 to 27, the story of the man who built his house upon a rock and the other guy who built his house on sand. And I call it three kinds of pressure. The rains came from the top. That's pressure from your head, how you think. The floods gathered around the house. That's pressure from your foundation your family background, the things you've learned, the things you've read, where you're coming from. And then the winds that blew, this pressure all around you, what your friends are telling you, what your peers are telling you, they're a fool, they're letting your wife control you, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> you must understand that pressure comes in those three dimensions, from the top, from the foundation, and from around you. And you must look. In my family, especially in the Johnson family. 
I doubt that I can count on five fingers. Folks whose marriages lasted till death do us part. I doubt it. I only know of one, George and his wife, that died last year. It's horrible. My sister, my older sister and her husband are still together. And they more than likely will be together till one of them goes. One is 74 and the other I think is, I think maybe 81 or 82. So they'll be together till they pass. Look around you. Look at your foundation. Look at your family. And make up your mind that yours will be different. We all have every reason to walk out of whatever. But how do you display character? How do you display resilience? How do you display Christian virtues? I'm not talking of situations where you're being abused. All right, most counselors and most Bible teachers, they counsel the three A's, abuse, abandonment, and adultery. Those are reasons for a marriage to break up. I counsel two, abuse and abandonment, because adultery can be forgiven. It's hard, but it can. God can give you the grace to forgive, especially if the individual is totally repentant and will not repeat that mistake again. If they're broken by the mistake, they won't repeat it. I know it's hard. And you're probably shaking your head in your, in your mind. But there's no sin that's unforgivable. If God can forgive you of everything you've done, why can't you forgive your spouse of adultery? Praise God forever. Right? <clears throat> Talk about submission. Submission is power. God designed for there to be checks and balances within the marriage so that there will not be an abuse of power. So while some powers of headship are vested in the man, the power of followership in the form of submission is vested in the woman. If a husband looks back and his wife is not submitted to him, he's not leading. He's merely taking a walk. The woman is called to submission. It doesn't mean you're subservient. It doesn't mean you're inferior. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you're not, you don't have brains. As a matter of fact, you might be smarter than the person you're married to. It's not about any of those things. It's about order. Right? A man cannot lead if the woman will not follow. So there's power in submission. It's like the head and the neck. Have you ever slept on your on your pillow in a funny way and you woke up with a crook in the neck and, and, and you, you go about the house doing one of these? Can the head turn? Because the neck is sick. It won't. So there's a balance of power the way God has structured it. Headship vested in the man, followership vested in you. Both are powerful. Right? If the man is the head and you're the neck, I'm sure you will agree that you wield awesome power. Because if the neck will not turn, the head cannot go in the required direction. All right. I talk about, uh, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. All right. The rest is, is uh, I'm not going to read the entire thing. Uh, to the husband, I talk about his headship. I talk about finding a wife. It means recognizing wife material. There are different kinds of women out there. Some are wives, some are not. 
And you find a wife, you find a good thing. And you obtain favor from God. Right? You're the priest over your home. That means you need to cover your home. Cover them spiritually. Cover them physically. Cover them financially. I've counseled with couples who have my money, your money. I don't understand it. Discipline. This is the discipline of your children. I hope you know that it's not of your wife. It's on you to discipline them. God says he hates divorce. He hates a man covering himself with violence. That means a man hitting his wife. The authority of your wife to discipline the children is derived from you. You must uphold her authority. Don't change or alter her instructions that have been passed to the children. If you disagree with what she said or done, settle that in the privacy of your bedroom, and then she will go back out and look for a way to uh, address the situation. The children must always see one united front. This is not to say you cannot overturn what she has said, but you convey a wrong impression to the children, especially when they are teens. The next time she tells them to do something, they won't take her seriously because you know they know you will come right behind her to cancel what she said. Don't keep sending the children to your wife for disciplinary measures. Makes them to see you as the goody two shoes and your wife as the hard one and the unyielding one and the unbending one. When you point them to the wrong authority, you abdicate your rightful place within the home. You also cause the children to perceive their mother as the one in charge. The next responsibility God gives you as a husband is to be the provider. He calls you to be the leader. A leader motivates. He doesn't manipulate. A leader does not drive. A leader leads. Isaiah 40, 11b says, the Lord gently leads those that are with young. The shepherd knows how to treat a pregnant sheep. He knows how to treat a sheep with little lambs. He doesn't treat them the same way he treats the male ones, and he doesn't treat them the way he treats even the female healthy ones. By example, show what needs to be done and how it should be done. Don't sit and throw orders around. That type of leadership only elicits murmuring, complaint, and ultimately rebellion. Do not demand submission either. Submission flows naturally out of your wife in response to your capable, loving leadership. A leader instructs. Okay? He motivates, he instructs. A leader leads by example. So you do it with the child. And then the last word, uh, that I added uh, concerning divorce. You may wonder and men uh, why the mention of divorce in the book on marriage, written with the intention to help couples chart a course for a successful godly marriage. The truth of the matter is that life happens. When I first wrote this book more than 20 years ago, I was happily married, or so I thought. Apparently, he was unhappy in marriage been for quite some time to the extent that he was no longer willing to keep trying. Whatever the case is, I am no longer married to him. And what that has afforded me is the ability to speak authoritatively from both sides of the fence. There are many reasons why husbands and wives throw in the proverbial towel, regardless of what God has expressly said in the Bible. Although one might argue that contextually God was speaking to the children of the priests of Israel. Some of these reasons may be as a result of abuse, emotional, psychological, neglect, physical, verbal, financial, infidelity, or other external interference. The word of God is not silent on any of these issues as is recorded, as is recorded in scriptures. I cite Malachi 2, 14 to 16 there. Sadly, uh, the society we now live in and all the attendant problems of this modern world 
put incredible pressure on Christian families. The desensitization to the real meaning of and the agitation for equality was the beginning of the breakdown of the traditional Christian family, where wives were the primary caregivers and were in direct control of the upbringing of the children in the family. It is the same lie and deception Eve bought, Eve bought into when the serpent beguiled her in the Garden of Eden. If she was confident in her identity, she should have told the serpent that she was already made in the image and likeness of God and did not need a piece of fruit to know that fact. Women obviously saw more value in going out to work outside of the home than staying at home to raise the children. Clamor for equality was misunderstood because it's not what you do that defines you, what or who you are. Having both parents working outside the home created myriads of problems as children were left to caregivers. Worse still, they became latchkey kids. The resultant effect of that being unsupervised kids growing up on their own. Being out at the workplace all day also led to an, incre to an increase in infidelity on the part of both husbands and wives. Home began to suffer as relationships deteriorated and the rest, as they say, is history. Looking back now, I can tell you that the reasons we fought in the marriage are so stupid. You look back and wonder why. Selfishness, not preferring one another, the influence of extended family, financial pressures, as we were a one income family at his in insistence that I stay at home. I was one of those wives who stayed home kicking and scratching. But I look back today and thank God for the opportunity to have been the primary in the lives of my children. The secret to stay in the course is as simple as following these three steps. One, choose each other daily. Make a conscious, not even effort, let it be a conscious thing to choose your spouse daily. Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Die to self daily. Die to flesh daily. Die to the enticement of the world daily. It's a daily decision. If you do that daily, it will become months. It will become years. It will become decades. And you'll be able to stay with the woman that you first loved and married. Man that you first loved and married. Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever would lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. The Christian walk is a daily walk with the Lord. Follow the Lord closely in fellowship and in prayer. Depend on him for his wisdom and his strength. Living through the marriage requires a daily sacrifice of denying the self. It will take help from God to do that daily. As Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I died daily. Self-preservation, choosing oneself above one's spouse is a sure way to begin to hold grudges and operate in unforgiveness. The Lord taught me that marriage is a giant boulder. When couples allow problems and issues to chip at the boulder incessantly, a weathering of sorts begin to chip the boulder until all that is left is a pebble. By that time, there is nothing left of the boulder. This is why in counseling, I've heard many couples say, we no longer have anything in common. We don't talk. Marriage takes work. You have to work at it to make it work. Number two, control external influences. I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that external influences played a major role in the dissolution of my marriage. From the time we were married, it was a running battle with my in-laws. The inability to firmly but lovingly put them in their place resulted in a wearing down of any resolve to stay the course. Friends and family members must learn that they are not a part of the union. They must be committed to the success of the marriage and do all within their power to observe the union. If they persist in interfering, then both husband and wife should not hesitate to surgically excise such meddling individuals. As number three, study the scriptures and pray together. As difficult as this may be, especially when things are headed south, 
Both of you must keep doing this together. Give God the opportunity to help you through your challenges and bring to an end the slippery slope towards separation and divorce. You cannot have your own Jesus and he or she, his or her own Jesus. Both of you must set aside, set aside self and allow God to bring about the answer as you pray and study scriptures together. Through wisdom, a house is builted. By understanding, it is established. And by financial knowledge, the Bible doesn't say so, but it's a particular, particular repository of knowledge. By financial knowledge, its chambers are filled with pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. God's word clearly states that it takes understanding to establish a home. Therefore, both of you are fully committed King in understanding of each other's likes or hang-ups. Review the chapter on effective communication and may the Lord help, help you both in Jesus' name. Amen. Questions and discussions? Fun. Good morning, Pastor Mo. Good morning. Thank you for that. Um, so I have a few questions. The first question is the idea, not the Bible says what God has put together that no man put asunder. When people are in a relationship where they realize we can't make this work, let's just say there's no abuse. There's none of the three A's that you mentioned, abuse, adultery, and abandonment, but differing views, um, everything is just, there's nothing in common. On the outside, how can you know if some God put somebody together and they're just having struggles or if God, or if they put themselves together and they never should have been together in the first place? And then, yeah. There's nothing God cannot fix. Oh, yeah, that's true. Nothing. Okay. And so if they value what marriage is, if they know what marriage is, and they value God's mind and God's wisdom, and their children involved, then they just got to go to God. Mm. Mm. There, there, there can't be anything that justifies disobeying the word of God. Mm. Especially when God has clearly spoken about an issue. Go to the word and submit to the word. Oh, okay. That's a good answer. Thank you. Chi Chi. Hi, Mama Mo. So my question, and good morning, family. My question is, um, who did you say wrote, um, I, excuse me if it's not a poem, you read something earlier. It sounded like a poem. Who wrote that? I wrote it. It's my, it's my poem. OMG. You know what I like? What spoke to me instantly when you were reading it? That could be something you do in your studio and advertise it. We can have poetry night. I actually wrote it as my finals because I took a course in TV production. I stayed at home for 23 years. And I picked up all kinds of things just to fill my time. Because he would leave for work at six. The kids would leave at eight to go to school. And they wouldn't be back till four. So I was by myself. So I picked mm. up all kinds of things. I'm a CCN, a Cisco certified network. I, I took a course in TV, TV uh, production. And that was supposed to be my finals. I was going to, to actually write it and film it. And, oh and, and speak in the voice of the child. But I couldn't find anyone to animate it for me. And so I just wrote it. And I didn't bother to film it. To film it. Well, it's never too late, too, because it was magnificent. Even Bridget was saying that she felt it. She felt it to tears. Like, it was beautiful. Like, you could really get creative with the studio with that. With some music softly playing in the background, background you know? Oh, well. Yeah. Whatever. Well, whatever. We'll see. <laughs> God bless you. Amen. And you too. Laurie. 
um, I want to just thank you. Um, you can't, you wouldn't believe how applicable this was to a telephone call I just got from my son who was um, like just so angry about so many um, things. And because of what we spoke about yesterday, I spoke to him about things. So he um, raised me to a challenge, but God's going to have to take care of that. He, he was very angry and he said, well, mom, if you can find a woman of that quality, when I come out of prison, I will make sure that I um, follow the values of what you have just spoken to me about. Well, I'm gonna send him your book um, <laughs> on marriage. And um, I'm going to pray that it helps to um, instill a new um, sense of responsibility in him. He said, um, I don't believe that any woman like that will be existent that I can um, you know, someday marry and call my wife. Um, How old is Mark? Mark is 29 years old. Oh, he's got all of his life in front of him. Well, he <laughs> thinks it's done. He, he thinks it's done. He's and, coming out. He's coming out of that place. Yes, he's completely changed man, and yes. he will preach the gospel. Well, we got to keep praying for him. Um, and we will. We will. I, but just, I, am, um, I am telling you, prophetically, that having come in contact with this ministry, he will preach the gospel. I was scared today um, because, yes, you know that he is a product of divorce and um, all of the three things that you said um, <laughs> were possibly reasons for divorce um, applied to our lives. But all of the other things that you said that happened in a family, um, I tried through prayer to um, battle those and I was not successful. Um, and I just feel um, so relieved that at least I know that in my heart I did the right thing because um, I have, you know, my friend Christine, and it just so happens that um, she knows how much marriage meant to me um, and that I still cry about the dissolution of my own marriage. Um, so I just pray that um, God has us covered. While in prison, Mark actually told me one day, I think dad regrets everything that ever like happened. And um, it doesn't make me like, you know, um, jump for joy, but it does um, give a um, sense of release and um, has taken the burden of my decision um, I, I'm giving it to God. I'm laying it at the cross. So thank you, Pastor Mo. I love you. Love you too. God bless you. Kathy M, since we have two Kathys now. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor Mo. Good so um, you, you answered uh, one of my questions yesterday about the death and um, remarriage uh, in order for me to, to remarry. But my question today is basically about faith. Um, uh, or forgiveness. So is it, is it God's mercy? Is this where God's mercy comes in that when you think that you've forgiven and the bitterness and the anger is gone or you feel like it's gone, but then there are days where it comes, like it could be like a word or a gesture or um, any little thing to trigger and you start having the bitterness and the anger come back again for, for, for a brief moment. Is that where his grace and mercy comes in? All right, let me, let, me, let me answer you this way. To the extent that you're not an imbecile or brain damaged, you won't forget the things done to you. If it was an abusive relationship, beating you up, slapping you up, locking you up, depriving you of money or food or whatever crazy things an abusive husband does. You can't forget it. It's there. But what does it do to you on the insides? That's when you know that you're free. See? Okay. So if it comes back, if the, the memory comes back, 
and the negative feelings come with it, then you're still struggling with the forgiveness. But if the memory comes back, and rather than all the bitter feelings coming back, you are grateful to God that you came out alive. You are thankful to God that look at me now. You know, then you have truly forgiven and released because it's not stirring up all the all the garbage. Mm -hmm. See? And if you're still feeling angry or bitter, then you need to go to God and ask him to help you. Okay. And you begin to confess. Faith comes by hearing. You need to begin to confess. Okay. It was, it, it was ignorance on his part. Okay. If he knew better, he would do better. Okay. Lord, I pray for John Doe. Mm -hmm. And I ask that you release me from whatever. See, when you pray for him, it changes your heart. Yes. It's not possible to pray for someone and you're still mad at them. Mm -mm. Okay. So uh, also remember that unforgiveness hurts you. Yes. Not them. Mm -hmm. So for my own sake, I will forgive you quickly. I don't want to deal with any garbage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. All right. I don't see any other hands up. I guess we're done. Tomorrow we're going to uh, go to the third book, Out of Darkness into Light. Again, I want to encourage you to come. There's a lot to learn in that book. How to be strong in the Lord. How to understand what you just went through or what you went through when you got born again. What your rights and your privileges are. How to disciple yourself. And how to disciple others. It's in the book, Christian Growth and Maturity. It's the central theme of the book. All right. Uh, Jay, do we have any announcements? Don, do we have any announcements? Offering. All right. We are asking. We're, we're asking that people give offering. It's 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 needed. All right, for us to be able to meet the bills. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Spirit of God will speak to you. You do the needful. Our mortgage is five thousand dollars a month, and we don't even get it. And I, I, I really want to start deliverance. I just don't have the foot soldiers to be able to start that ministry. And this morning, I woke up pretty early. I was up as early as four. I was praying and it, it just came to me that there'd be a lot of people who need it. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't really start deliverance ministry without having a team in place and most certainly we need men because if ever there is a manifestation any demonic manifestation women can't handle it because they get so strong it's it's unbelievable when those demons begin to manifest but it is well by following his spirit he will lead so I ask that you give text um, IBBC give to this number, 54244. I know that you can also Zell. If you can, put it up on the chat so that people see um, ways that they can give. If you have any ideas uh, on how we can generate finances for the work of the ministry, please uh, feel free to come up with it. I have a recording studio. I'm going to I'm going to be more intentional with it in terms of um, in terms of marketing it and and um, running it. Folks who want to record so that we can generate um, finances. The studio has been locked up for a couple of years. It's time to put it to work. Praise God. I think now, Pastor Bowie, I'm sorry. Uh, since your book situation is fixed with Amazon, and now we have different people uh, who are hearing the overview of your books, 
I think the sale will increase tremendously. Okay. But my books are my books. I publish them with my money. Yeah, but yeah. that'd be your money, so you won't be stressed out. But, and we also- no, I'm not stressed those out. Who have given their commitment that they would be faithful and give. Yeah, I'm not stressed out financially, personally. The reason why I become stressed out is because I take everything I have- Absolutely. To pay, to pay for the mortgage. See? But if the ministry will begin to generate its own finances, then I won't have to use my money yeah. to do that. Yeah. But I, I'm not I'm not stressed out. I'm just saying people should step up and be more consistent and responsible. Yeah. Don't don't be sporadic because the bills are not sporadic. They come every month. That's where it says set aside at the beginning of the week. Boy, that's you what the Bible to give. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. God knows it's it's you know, if you wait till they say end of the month, I want to do this, you just might not be able to. One cup of Starbucks, eight but eight dollars. If you set aside eight dollars a day, we'll have two hundred and fifty dollars. All right. Pastor Quick question. Are we able to order the t-shirts long distance? I don't see why not. Okay. Yeah. We also have t-shirts that we made. I, I'm just not one to, to push for merchandise and, and stuff like that. If you, if you guys can, can handle it, handle it. I'm not sure he's the one handling the t-shirts, but they're there. And we did it so that we could raise the funds. One. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. Um, speaking on the finances, good morning. Um, it came up to my mind. Um, can you speak a little bit on first fruits offerings? First fruits? Or is that too out of topic? No, no, no. If you want to know about it, it's very yeah. simple. God just required his children to bring the first fruits of their increase. So if I if I transact uh, a business and I make five thousand dollars from it, then I bring the first fruits of it's the first fruit of the business. I bring it to God. It's something you give one time, and that's it. You understand? First fruits is not something you give all the time. So it would be like the whole or. Yes. It's a piece or? The whole, the first fruit of that business. Say I set up, I set up uh, selling phones. Okay. And in the first month, okay. my profit from selling, I buy the phones at $10. I sell them for $5, for, for $15. I've made $5 on every phone. I bought 10 phones. My first fruit is $50. I bring it to God. You understand it doesn't mean next month i must bring it again and the next month i must bring it again and no okay. first fruit I, is the I first fruit know. is the first fruit from so that would that um be a line you're breaking up um uh is it better now? You're, you're breaking up. I can't make out anything you're saying. Do you want to put it in the chat? Um, sorry. Um, I can hear you, but um, it's, it's kind of garbled. I'm in the garage. Can't make it out. Okay. It's okay. I know that yes. some some pastors and some churches expect first fruits every month. No, that's not accurate. Thank you. The tithe is is constant. First fruit is the first fruit from that business concern. 
And that's it. God is not mean. Why would you ask for first fruit every month? Ask for tithes every month? Ask for offering every month? No. Until. Hey, good morning. Um, is the discipleship book available for purchase? Yes, I believe that one is on uh is on uh Amazon. Okay. I just didn't know. I would have been got it. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? Again, I'm gonna share this with you. Um Father, we thank you for your word. We give it praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for your written word in Job 5.12. We speak it in confidence and boldness, knowing that it will never return to you void. Prosper where we have sent it to. It will accomplish the purpose for which we are sending it out. And therefore, Lord, we speak Job 5.12 to the north. You disappoint, disappoint the devices of the crafts of the hands and of the hands and of the hands of the hands of the hands of the hands of the south. the disappoint the devices of the east. You disappoint the devices of the their hands cannot perform the enterprise. And Lord, we speak to the West. You disappoint the devices of the crafty craft so that their hands cannot perform the enterprise. Thus we have spoken, thus it shall be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I will see you all tomorrow when we will deal with the third book. I hope you've gotten something out of all of this. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs>